Welcome to Dreaming the Light. I'm Joanna, your guide on this transformative dream journey. In this podcast, we will explore the world of dreams, sleep, and rest, uncovering their remarkable healing potential, even in the most challenging times. Discover practical tools to navigate nightmares, anxiety, and trauma-related sleep issues as we embark together on a quest to unlock the healing power of your dreams. Hello, everyone. I have a great pleasure to introduce my guest today, uh, Uma Dimsmortuli. She is a yoga therapist, a co-founder of Yoga Nidra Network, an author of several books on women's yoga and yoga nidra, of course, and a teacher and trainer. And she is also a very dear teacher for me because I studied yoga nidra with her. And today I would like to talk with her about the importance of yoga nidra and rest, especially during a very challenging times. Right now, there is a lot of pain, grief, trauma, hatred, noise. There is so much noise that it is becoming almost impossible to hear ourselves, our hearts, to really stay connected to our true essence. And we need to find ways of helping anyone who is feeling right now that it's all too much, that they don't know how to cope, to find rest and connection back to ourselves, to our bodies, to our hearts, and to the whole world, to everyone. So thank you, Uma, for being here. and. Maybe would you like to start by saying a little bit about your journey to Yoga Nidra and, and what Yoga Nidra is to you? So thank you so much, Joanna, for inviting me here. And I'm hoping that what I may share will benefit all beings. And yeah, the definition of Yoga Nidra, as many people will know, but just in case you don't, Nidra is a Sanskrit word and it means sleep or rest. And yoga nidra means the yoga of sleep or rest or the sleep of the yogis or the rest, which is yoga. Basically what it is, when you look at it, is it doesn't look like much at all. It's a, a practice of non-doing, a practice of being, of restful being. And it's usually done horizontal. You lie down. Pretty much anyone can do it. You lie down and you listen. You don't need to pay attention to what you hear. You might hear a live voice. It's like a horizontal meditation. And it brings you into a very particular place in between sleeping and waking, threshold place, like a liminal space. And so it's a very potent medicine, both, yeah, as a yoga therapy practice for, for healing physical ailments, but also really powerfully as a way to help us reset our rhythmic cycles so it can support healthy sleep a reduction in stress, even under really adverse circumstances. And it's quite an interesting access point for dreams and or nightmares for reviewing and reconnecting and consolidating memory. So there's a, so many benefits that it, and it's partly, I think one of the most, I think it is one of the most accessible yoga practices because you don't need to move. You just need to be, you don't even act, you just need to lie down basically and do nothing and simply be. So it's a, a remedy for all the human doings that are out there is just for us to just stop and take really deep rest. So it's, yeah, it's both the meditation and a healing therapeutic practice. And what else did you ask me? Or how I came to it? Yes, I... exactly. How did you find your way to your Ganidra? Uh, yeah, and like a lot of people, as a child, I naturally inhabited those those quite dreamy states, you know? A lot of kids do it, you know, lucid dreaming and then like really creative places. I was a very creative child. I spent a lot of time in nature and writing poems and songs and all this kind of thing. And the state of that experience, I rediscovered again in probably my late 20s actually when I encountered a formal practice of yoga nidra and uh, yeah about when I was yeah about actually it's nearly 30 years ago now but anyway yeah I was I, I was like 28 29 and I I said oh this is a practice people are teaching but it brings me into that exact same space like a kind of it's not you know it's in between sleep and waking it's very it's like the mother load of creativity so I'm a writer 
And I found that like in that state, you would never run out of things to write. <laughs> so some of my books are quite large because I would keep going into that state and realizing there was another chapter. So, so I was fortunate enough, like, you know, to discover that it was, a, it's a very reliable practice. It always seemed to work. And uh, yeah. And I had encountered yoga as a child, actually, at about the age of four. Oh, my mom, I practiced other kinds of yoga and meditation because it was on the TV. So <laughs> in 1969, 1970, I was watching this TV with my mom. So, but yoga nidra, yeah, is, I, it is a naturally arising state. It arises naturally. It's, an, it's a, one of the spectrum of, of human consciousness. It's one of the things we can all access. And it's also, so it's a state of being. But currently, a lot of people know of it as a, as a practice because there's a lot of different schools that teach different methods. And all those methods that are called yoga nidra are ways to access the state of yoga nidra, which is this state of restful, meditative being in which you get insight and you also get a really profound and effective way just to kind of like downregulate the nervous system. It's been really useful for people dealing with trauma. So that's what it is and how I found it. So when I started to listen to these practices, like, oh, yeah, I know how this feels. Now mm. here's a live way to access that state. It felt very positive, yeah. Yeah, it's, uh, once, you, once, you are in, once you are in that place, as you said, it's a well of creativity, of rest, of a lot of beautiful things, I think, depending also on the person. But what I wanted to ask you next is, as you mentioned, there are several schools and different methods of practicing yoga nidra, and you developed your own that it's called total yoga nidra. Could you tell me a little bit about the yoga nidra that you teach? Yeah. So I think it's it's like a lot of things that humans do or naturally arising states that human people find is that we find different methods of approaching that state. So I'd studied a number of different approaches some of which I quite liked and some of which I, I kind of didn't like, but they all had something valuable. Mm. So we developed our own method because, I mean, I founded the Yoga Nidra Network with my husband, Elipta, who's been doing Yoga Nidra even longer than I have. And what we looked at was the fact that a lot of individual schools would say, oh, this is my way of doing it. This is my way of doing it. We were like, well, supposing all those different ways all had something valuable. Supposing that, which is kind of how it is, well, then what about if we used all of those different methods in a much more creative way? So I'd say the hallmark of what we're doing is it's, it's creative and very responsive. So I tend to do a lot of work of co-creating yoga nidra, like for people's their individual healing. But for groups, I do a lot of work facilitating the group's rest and people call in what they would love to hear. And so we weave it together. So I think the key distinction of what we call it total yoga nidra, because we were like using all the totally like looking at all the different kinds there were and taking what felt good from all of them and putting them together. But we also, I worked with like wild nidra, which is where you, you don't even need words. You go out into the countryside or into the wildness and you can listen and use the same protocols and there's also like, I realized after we wrote this little book called The Yoga Nidra Made Easy, and I've been working on an encyclopedia, which is not a little book, it's a, for nine years now, actually. <laughs> and oh. when doing all that research, I realized quite clearly, as a lot of, well, I think other people have, that it's a naturally arising state. And so I often work with something that I just call natural, naturally arising yoga nidra, which is where when you've learned the different formats, then often it will just naturally arise by itself. It's a bit like if you've learned certain musical forms, you know, mm -hmm. a certain kind of song or even a certain kind of musical scale or a melody that actually, if you know it really well, when you just rest, then it will sort of arise by itself. And so all of those things, like the total yoga nidra, the wild nidra and the naturally arising nidra came out of this place that it was all one state and it manifests in lots of different ways. So lots of people have different ways to get there. And why not use all the poetry and the music? And, you know, I use lots of little instruments and mo and bells and chimes and hand pans. And like, as, as I've, I've been doing it for so long now, and lots of poetry. So mm. one of the elements of what we're doing is it sounds, I've recovered a really key part that I think is quite relevant to what we're talking about. That's very soothing and very comforting. 
And that is a rhythmic yoga nidra to remind us how to rest where the rhythms of the voice let us settle into sleep. You can hear what I'm doing. It's like you create yeah. like a lullaby. Yes, it's very, and very relaxing. Yeah, my main job I... being a mother. <laughs> and, and I learned a lot of things. I think, you know, learning how to settle small people and how to be present so that people can rest and sleep. And, and a lot of the essentially the original kind of writings about yoga nidra, it comes from a South Asian tradition that's very ancient. And the goddess, there's actually a, a goddess called Nidra Shakti, for me. And Nidra Shakti literally means the power of sleep. And she, as a goddess figure, appears in the Mahabharata, in these ancient Indian poems. So she gets left out of a lot of Western approaches to yoga nidra because she's a goddess from from india and and i like to put her put her back in <laughs> and when when you encounter ways of like doing some of the things you do in yoga nidra like bringing your awareness around the body that's very comforting and it's often done in some of those very ancient texts in rhythmic ways that it's written in very beautiful Sanskrit verse with particular rhythms and patterns and rhymes and all of these things and and I, I, I feel like if I've, I've been able to support the development of yoga nidra in any way, it's to bring back the creativity and the heart in the form of rhyme and rhythm and like and lullabies. It's a very, I'd say it's a real expression of the deep feminine. I don't mean it's a women's practice as in, you know, a gendered practice that only certain people can do. I mean, there's a quality of that deep feminine of the goddess, yoga nidra shakti and what we do. Yes. Yeah, I can definitely feel this feminine presence when practicing with you during our course or during our group nidras. And one of the things that I find incredibly important in the way that you teach yoga nidra is that it's very, as you said, it's very open, it's very creative, it's very accessible, and it puts you in this place when you you, you are being told, you know, you can't do it wrong, and you just... You listen to me, keep connection with my voice, but like, if you don't want to do something that I'm offering, just don't do it. And this quality of yoga nidra, this, this approach of yoga nidra, it's so liberating and it's so empowering. And I think that we are always told what we need to do, how we need to do, you know, even when we practice asana, it's everything needs to be as someone else is saying. And with yoga nidra, what I find so beautiful is that you can really make it your own practice. And when you are tired, when you are stressed, when you are going through very hard circumstances, when life is unbearable, it, there is no one way that yoga nidra can help you. There's so many ways in which you can use yoga nidra and how you can benefit from this practice the way that you need it. I mean, one of the ways you can define and understand this um, practice, which is based on a state of being, is that it's an adaptogen. It's, it, it's an adaptogenic, like, like ginseng or ashwagandha or lots of different herbs. They, they work in synergy. There's a kind of intelligence in the practice and an intelligence in the being, and they kind of get together. And like, actually, you can trust that if you're tired, your organizer will probably help you go to sleep. If you're looking for inspiration, it'll probably give you inspiration. If you're ill, you've had injuries or surgery or something, you've been in hospital, then actually you can listen to your ganidra for healing. I've collected so many different examples of case studies of people using yoga nidra to heal brain injuries, to support recovery from cancer, to go through chemotherapy. You know, all the list is pretty much endless <laughs> because if you think about how beneficial it is to rest, you will be restoring the rhythmic cycle. So things like digestive disturbances, menstrual disturbances, insomnia, all of these things are all about dysregulation of cycles for all sorts of reasons. And what yoga nidra will do is in, in any given situation will allow you to have what you need that you to help reset your body to these cycles of health and wellness. It's because it's actually mimicking certain of the different cycles, brainwave cycles that you go through when you're sleeping, but it's not a replacement for sleep. I want to stress that. A lot yes, of people very important. It's a bit like a sleep supplement. It will enhance your capacity to rest, 
you know, if you do it in the day or the evening time, but it also tends to be really supportive for your nighttime sleep as well. Yeah. As in, you, you can do it to get to sleep. If you wake up in the middle of the night and you're very disturbed, then it can help you get back to sleep. If you wake up really early in the morning for whatever reason, then you might be able to listen to yoga nidra and that will send you back in. So it's like constantly restoring your rhythmic cycle. So the intelligence of your body's wisdom can be heard. And it's usually saying, you are tired. You are tired. That's what it, I'd say we are a completely exhausted species at this point, which is one of the reasons we're making such terrible decisions, how we deal with our planet and the tired people are making these decisions. And I always say that tired people are shitty people, forgive me my vocabulary, but this is what happened. And this is also the whole point of of understanding the importance of rest. Rest is not only so you can continue being in the machine of your crazy life. Rest is, this specific rest is for really getting into the center of your heart, of your being, reconnecting with who you really are, with your soul, with your spirit. It really doesn't matter how you call it. To understand who you really are and how you want to show yourself, your, show yourself to the world. Because as you said, we are a species of exhausted, overworked, lost, really lost, lost humans. And the decision we make on the personal, but also on the collective level are, are devastating. We, we are witnessing it right now. And I feel that this understanding that the exhaustion is causing so much of this pain is still not really out there. And I, I meet this all these false beliefs about resting, even, even in the normal times, even not in the times of crisis that, you know, oh, I rest when I'm wherever retired or I will rest some other time or rest, it's, it's being unproductive or lazy. How to deal with this resistance? What would you say to people that still see the rest in this way? Even, again, talking for now about the regular life circumstances. Yeah. It's, you've made such a valuable point, my love. It's exactly there is resistance to rest. I've been saying it for a very long time. But if you flip that around, rest is resistance. Resistance to what? Resistance to this incredible machinery of industrial capitalism and colonization that drives us to believe that we are only so good as what we produce, that we are worthless in and of ourselves, that we're only here to, to work to earn money, to buy stuff that mostly we don't need. But anyway, I've got opinions about this. But what you see is people, our brains, they don't function very well when we're tired. And that's kind of the point. What will happen is a lot of the patterns of our natural cycles of like knowing that we're tired, knowing that we need to rest, have been overridden by the demands of our jobs. So that people are like, instead of, you know, they're just, they're not really living. They're just working and then crashing. And then we, we've, it's come so that something like burnout is considered to be like a, like a somehow perfectly normal kind of activity. It's not normal to be that tired that you burn out. But what we've got from the very moment when the industrialists decided that they could get the light and keep people working through shifts and override sleep patterns, the moment that started to happen, then people became so disconnected from our, our natural cycles that they don't even know how tired they are. And I think the resistance people have to rest is that they actually hardly haven't realized how tired they are because they never stop, you know, like t wired, tired, but wired. So they keep on going on. And also because we're surrounded by a culture that places masses of, of emphasis on how much you earn and what you do and zero value on the qualities of just being, and also acts of nurture, self-nurture and the nurture of others is totally valueless. It's not valued in any way at all. You can see by the way that people send young you know, mothers back to work you know, or, or don't provide support for parents to be looking after little children. There's a whole set of things going on, but the fundamental resistance I see is either because people have not even realized how tired they are because they never rest, so they're just so wired, they can't even tell how tired they are and they've lost completely, and they're disconnected from those cycles. Or because re people believe this propaganda. It is a kind of propaganda. 
it's just a, 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 a cultural norm that's been become so widespread that people can't even see this is actually it's a form of colonized thinking that it's okay to always be exhausted and you know working when we are awake for the benefit of earning money and and to bear be aware that there are very powerful entities not i mean entities like ghosts i mean like corporate entities like businesses who profit from our exhaustion and from our disconnection. For example, Netflix, if you would like to take a good example, mm. who from people not sleeping. And when their CEO was asked, who's your main opposition? What he said was, well, our main opposition here at Netflix is sleep. Sleep mm. is the, wow. Because when people are sleeping, they're not watching that. They don't watch. Yeah. <laughs> they're sleeping. They're having their own dreams. They don't need yeah, to. They don't need to watch the TV show. And other people's dreams, people, we have our own dreams, but we don't dream, as you all know. We don't dream when we're tired. Tired people don't dream. Maybe tired people are tired because they're getting nightmares. But like, basically, we d we're in a culture that does not value rested people and seeks to do as much as possible to keep us exhausted because then we're more likely to purchase things to make us feel better, like mm -hmm. energy drinks and caffeine and of various course. like this. But also... We make really poor decisions when we're tired. So they want to catch you. That's, I'm sure you've noticed, you know, that's when you're, when you're tired. That's when you're like, you do too much more on social media. You don't want to be on there, but you're tired. So your willpower is down. So you'll do whatever. So, so these things are, and they make us ill. Yeah, you know, I even heard there was some real store rhythmic cycles because like the digestive system, the sleep cycles, the menstrual cycles, all our kind of like circadian rhythms, they all get screwed up properly when we're exhausted. Yeah. There is even like, I, I just read an article recently about there is a new term uh, about what you said when you like come so tired from work and you put Netflix or you keep scrolling because you're so tired. So you don't really make the right decisions and they call it uh, revenge scrolling. Okay. Because the whole day you've been working You've been working very hard and then you kind of want to take the revenge when you are back home. So you do something that's completely detrimental for you, but you feel like you are getting your revenge, right? I've been working so hard. So now I'm going to be for three hours on my phone before I fall asleep. And then I'm all like with this blue light and, and I cut my sleep hours and I'm just overexposing myself to a news and to, to the chaos that it's happening in the internet and like how you can find your center, how you can find your feet like on the ground if this is what you are surrounded uh, by all the time. And also, if you ask someone, so what do you do with this during the weekend? Yeah, I'm planning to rest. I'm going to go see my friends and I'm going to do shopping and then I'm going to do this and I'm going to watch TV. And like, how do you believe that this is real rest? The idea of what really rest is, I think it's completely messed up because there is the, the okay, there is the active part of rest like maybe doing sport or like seeing people it is resting right but but what about the the passive what about the the, the most nurturing type of rest that we need like yoga nidra like meditation like breath work like walking in silence in the nature you know it can be so many things that it's the actual rest that calibrates you to your balance your wholeness exactly. it's about wholeness and recalibration and when i say that we're looking at rest as it's a, it's a deep nourishment. It's a healing. It's actually a medicine so that the body can actually restore itself. And I have, I, I've witnessed so many positive things happening from something so simple mm. as actually making 20 minutes every day. It's as simple as that, just to take one yoga nidra to listen to it. It's free. <laughs> you can do it anywhere. And, and I've watched, hun I mean, it's thousands of people now, Joanna. I mean, I've been doing this a long time, watching just how simple as, as a, a healing method this is. It's just really nourishing for people and they just feel better. Whatever it is, you're likely just to feel a bit better because you're A, not so tired, and B, you've had this uh, opportunity to completely connect with the wholeness and in yoga therapy, we have this idea that you're, you're not just one body. It's not just you're resting because your physical body is tired. You've all had that experience. Like 
yeah, your physical body might be tired, but your mind is doing another kind of tiredness. So there's the physical body, there's your energy, your vitality, yeah. there's your thoughts and emotions. All of these are different bodies. There's also an intuitive body. That's the fourth body where you're a deep inner knowing, which is really always there. It's never been taken away from us. The fifth body is the great what is. We're all part of the one, you know? And you can experience, I believe, a, a healing at all those dimensions of being. And that's immensely helpful for just reconnecting to your own wisdom, which is free. So that you're not dependent on like sleeping pills and antidepressants, all these things that you get given largely because you're out of regulation, you know, and, and because you might have experienced trauma and grief and pain and all these things that come along with being human. It's a painful thing, you know, and it can be painful to watch if you, even if you're not in pain to watch the pain other humans are inflicting upon each other. That is also painful. Why? Because we're all one. When... And you really get to, when people who practice like lucid dream and the experiences of nidra meditation, you can sense there is one consciousness. It's a self-aware universe and we are part of this. And the sooner <laughs> as many of us as possible rest back into that awareness, the better it will be for everybody. And every tiny act of rest, I believe, is, is just a really powerful, hopeful act because you're saying, I will take this time to rest. And then that benefit isn't just for you. It's for all the people around you who don't have to deal with the narky version of you. Exactly. <laughs> Thank you for saying oh, yeah. that. Oh. Yeah, this is, this is such a good point. Because, again, many people see rest as something selfish, right? And especially, let's say, someone is dealing with very hard circumstances. And we feel like so many people depend on us. and and we need to do things for other people. And we see, you know, ourselves in service constantly. But where is this part? Where is this understanding that the, the more exhausted you are, the less rest you receive? You can't show up as your best self. You can't really give all of these beautiful things that you want to give to others if your cup is empty. And I know it's such a cliche, but still, I, I can see it. When people say, I don't have time to rest. I have too many kids. I don't have time to rest. I, I don't know. I just lost someone that I love. Uh, my country is in crisis. Like whatever reason is, I, I don't have time to rest. I need to be doing, doing, doing. And again, we're coming back to the beginning of our conversation of this idea that only by doing, by producing, we bring the value. And then also to the point that if you don't have, you, you can't give. And what you give is, is not really, it, it, it's much less than what you could give if you were really rested. That's yeah. an act that's, for self-nurture, but it's actually an act of, of, of community resilience building, right? Because what happens when people rest together is that we, when we reboot, you know, we, re, we all come up at the same, the same level of consciousness and awareness. We all rise up rested together. And that's really, really important. And we can access what I believe is a really primal sense of safety even in very dangerous places. I mean, you can activate a, a, a primal sense of safety by lying down and listening to the voice, which is what you do with yoga nidra. You hear a voice. Because if you think about it, as, as humans in our kind of evolutionary traje trajectory, we would have spent a lot of time together living in community, sitting around fires and knowing that you were safe so long as the other humans were awake. You know, so if you were a little child in this primal version of humanity you know you might have drifted asleep at the fire and heard all the stories that the elders were sharing and know that you're safe because all the other humans are awake and they're minding the fire you're not gonna get a spark come on you and catch a light and neither is some predator gonna come and get you because all the other humans are talking or even if there's just one person talking so the act of just lying and rest maybe with your headphones on or maybe just with it on a, a speaker and hearing this voice that you don't need to pay attention to does something really profoundly restful to our nervous systems. Because I think it taps into this really ancient primal experience that, okay, I can hear the voices of the other humans. I'm safe. It's safe for me to rest. They're watching out for me. And that's the kind of language I use when I'm teaching yoga nidra, like not like do not move, do not sleep, but like 
You know, you've arrived, you're in exactly the right place. You've got all the right people around you. You don't need to pay any attention to anything I'm saying. Just, just so you can hear a voice, that's all that needs to happen. That's it. And that you can get as comfortable as you like. So it's like, a, it's deeply permissive and it's all about the agency of that person to do what they need to. And that's often really healing, especially if you're living a life where you actually don't have much agency, like because you're caught up in some hideous job where you, you know, your, your time is in your own. And especially thinking of parents and, you know, when you've got young children or even looking after elderly relatives, there's these times in life where we're often in big demand, like when you've got little kids or when you've got elderly relatives, yeah. you're around sick, then you do need to show up for them. But you'd be amazed, give it a try, how if you show up and offer to rest with them, the kid, we've got loads of yoga nidra for kids because we got yoga nidra for free in like 23 different languages. Yeah, I'm going to add uh, to the show notes the, the link to the library, the, the incredible library of yoga nidras that you created. And as you said, it's free. So if this is what you would like, just get to the website and... and- <laughs> And there's some for listening with kids. And there's actually some of the kids' ones are quite fun. They're quite playful. Hmm. There are a lot of adults who like to listen to the kids' ones. Yeah. Just think, and it's as simple as that. You've got nothing to lose. It doesn't cost you anything except for 20 minutes of your time just to lie there. And, and give it a try. Don't take my word for it. Just see how you feel. And what I notice is that the people make a daily connection to it. So part of my, my favorite part of my job <laughs> is making sure that these little groups of people I look up, they all get a yoga nidra every day. Some from members from my back catalog, sometimes because it's new, but like actually, and then the, the, the feedback that comes from that simple act, all they're doing, the only thing they're doing that's only different is like making 20 minutes to rest and listen to a yoga nidra every day. And the reports are fantastic, specifically around sleep. They're saying like, now I know that I'm tired and now I can rest. And I'm able to sleep or um, improvements in like menopausal symptoms, improvements in pain, if you know, things that don't, you can reduce the relationship, you know, the, the intensity of the pains that you're experiencing, whether it's joint pain or heartbreak or whatever it is, or grief, you know, these are all pains that we experience. And I think it's a little bit like a, a healing balm that is actually from, it's your body's own self healing mechanism. That kicks in when we're when we're resting. Yeah, yeah. get better. Exactly. Healing burn. And what what would you say was maybe kind of modification you would recommend to someone that let's say it's very stressed. It's hard for them to lie down. They are scared of closing their eyes. Like you know, there can be not ideal conditions around. So can yoga nidra still be practiced and still be beneficial with certain modifications? Yeah, I think there are nearly always a diff- there's ways you can change the practice so that, for example, if you're experiencing really high anxiety or panic attacks, then the idea of lying there flat out on the floor is is just not yeah. you can't go there. You can't, but you don't have to lie like that. I find if if we set up the physical posture, perhaps in a more kind of protected way, mm-hmm. side curled up in the fetal position, maybe with a weighted blanket. Maybe with lots of bolsters, and you don't, and to know you don't need to uh, to close your eyes. You can keep your eyes open if you feel safer. So those two simple modifications tend to make it much more possible and accessible for you to do if you're experiencing panic and anxiety. You know, it's actually you just make the body feel the nervous system a little bit more kind of contained, so you're snuggled in a little bit. That can make a difference. Yeah, and knowing also, it round, you don't have to lie there really still. You can wriggle about and fidget. <laughs> Yeah. And also the length of the practice, it doesn't need to be very long to be effective, right? No, that's the thing. I mean, I'd say an average or typical practice might be 20 minutes, half an hour, sometimes 40 minutes, but it doesn't need to be that long. In Yoga Nidra Made Easy, we did a special Yoga Nidra that was like nine, 10 minutes long, 13 minutes. My sense is that if you practice quite a bit, then you don't need such a long practice to get into that state. And also, if you're new to the practice, a longer practice, a longer recording is just like not very accessible. Whereas if it's like, oh, it's only 15 minutes. So when we train yoga nidra teachers, as you know, we give everybody just 15 minutes and say, you've got 15 minutes and you cover the whole practice. There's about 10 components in most forms of yoga nidra. And you can do all of those 10 components in that 15 minutes. So it can be short. 
and you can do it sat up if you like if you need to in a in an airplane or in a you know some transport situation you know yeah, yeah it's really besides of driving and I think it can really be done almost in you can do it when you're driving it's okay if you're a passenger but not if you're driving yeah. be able to pay attention and you're exactly you're, you can drift side even if you are resting your eyes a little bit open the gaze goes inside and now you're going to go yeah Yes, and getting back to your book, uh, Your Ganidra Made Easy, I think for everyone who is, not only for people that are new to Yoga Nidra, but maybe for people that would like to understand a little bit more about Yoga Nidra and, and don't know much or would like to refresh of what they know or think Yoga Nidra is, I would really recommend this book. And also even the audiobook. I myself got an audiobook and it's beautifully combined the, the theory with the practice. So there are chapters where you describe different components of Yoga Nidra and then you have the Yoga Nidra itself. So just to everyone that if you'd like to get some Yoga Nidras and explanation and practicing different components of Yoga Nidra. So that book or audiobook, it's, it's really great. I would really recommend it. Yeah. It's a good, it's intended that book to make, do what it says on the tin, to make it easy so that everyone can do it by themselves. So there's actually, you get an audio book, but there are 42 audio recordings that go with the book. They come out, half of them in my voice and half in my husband's voice. So you get this lovely, yeah, comparison. Yeah. I'm glad you found it useful. <laughs> yeah, incredibly. It's, it's really great. I go back to it very often. Could you, if someone asks you, Uma, okay, so I, I understand there are so many benefits and it seems like it's really a remedy for so many things, but in simple words, what exactly is happening that so much is happening? I like, I, maybe it's not so easy to explain because we're not going to go into too much maybe physiology now and stuff like that, but maybe someone said like, okay, but how does it work? Like how this is so amazing? So yeah, how, what is happening? Okay. So the simple way to describe what is happening is that the body is like the body is settling and also the mind into a sort of state of balance and ease. So what happens is at the beginning is you just slow down a little bit because you've stopped and all kinds of things are noticeable. Usually some of the key signs that you're entering that state or is that your breath kind of gets a little steady and then a bit shallow sometimes it's actually quiet so you might have occasional deep breaths people often notice saliva like they sometimes drool a little bit and you often hear the digestive system singing away now these are all signs that you're going into the state of yoga nidra but they're also telling you these things are happening what is happening is all the energy that now you're not thinking your way into kind of a panicky state your digestive system has energy to function properly. That's why it's making those noises. Sometimes people fart, <laughs> you know, and they just, what's happening is your body is getting the energy that it needs to rest. And then once that starts to happen, you're actually cycling through all the different sorts of wave states. The electrical activity of the brain in yoga nidra is mimicking these different processes that you go through when you go into sleep. So you hover in this hypnagogic state, which is like as you're drifting into sleep and then you're Actually, some people will go into a dream state. There'll be rapid eye movement. But actually, all of these things are happening as the signs that you're resting. And then there's huge available energy is released. This is why people feel refreshed afterwards. Because you you basically get to have a little bit of a rest from being yourself. You can kind of mm. hang up the personality, like taking off a heavy coat. Like, oh, I'll take off the coat and I'll take off the shoes. And I'll be like... Oof. And then you're like, you know what? All those bags, you put everything down. You're like, do I need to pick any of that up again? So I think it gives you a changed perspective on who you think you are. I usually joke the simple way to explain it is that your waking self actually gets to meet your resting self. Mm -hmm. And your resting self is really wise. The resting self is like, yeah, we've got this. Let's, let's, let's sort out some digesting. Let's sort out some dreaming, which is like the emotional digestive system. It's like that's processing emotions. Let's just, and then sometimes insights come. So all of this is happening and you can track it physiologically. One of the things they've done it with sort of studies in yoga nidra is to track the brain waves, which they've, you know, been able to document really clearly. Also, there's an increased release of, of dopamine as well, like an extraordinary elevated. And also you see, uh, um, what I observe is that uh, oxytocin, which is our, our love hormone, and it's a hormone of nurture and caring, that's an anti-inflammatory 
substance. It's endogenous. We grow it within ourselves. So when people are like gently rocking or feeling how, they usually experience less acute pain. And what's happening in Yoga Nidra very often is think this isn't something that's been measured. I'd quite like to set up some study to see if we could measure oxytocin levels because what I observe, and you've seen it yourself, especially when people practice together, is they just they feel a sense of well-being that's rooted in the connection with this this loving anti-inflammatory. I don't just mean like the inflammation in the physical body, but all the inflamed thoughts that lead to hatred. Mm. It just settles down, you know, and allows us to access the kind, rested version of who we can all be. Yeah, that's it. That's not even going into the meditative awareness. There are gamma waves and all sorts of other things, but I think that gives you a feel of it. Yes, that's a beautiful explanation. And it takes me to the place of talking about this inner wisdom, about this this place of knowing of our intuition, of our source. And how would you say that we could use Yoga Nidra also for, for connecting to ourselves, to our true nature? Is there any kind of specific practice or any kind of elements that you would recommend for a person that they would like to, you know, reach this place because maybe if you're very confused, they feel again, totally overwhelmed. And usually in those situations, the stress, the, the trauma, it's, it disconnects us from ourselves, from this, this inner teacher, as you, as you call it very often. Yeah. So I think if your intention really is to, to reconnect to your inner teacher, then the most important thing you can do is, is to trust that the body's wisdom is very mm. ancient. And if you just make space to rest, the body will do all those things I was just talking about. So I suggested problems, sort of this. And we can have it, we can have, place our trust in the power of life. So some people will, will place trust in, you know, a, a deity or a philosophy or a prayer. And they can also all come into Yoga Nidra, whatever faith you have or not, can be there with you, whatever is comforting for you. But effectively, what it is that you're witnessing is the supreme power of life herself. When we actually submit to rest, then that wisdom of the body is cellular. It's also quantum because we're part of a self-aware universe. So the processes you're going through in Yoga Nidra are the same processes by which the whole universe replicates and creates, you know, endlessly creates. So my sense, I don't know if I've answered it really well, is that, that to reconnect to that sense of who you are and re it's it, to rediscover your inner teacher the first step is that you can actually trust that your body given space and time is actually wise enough to know how to heal and rest mm. well, rest in order to heal and that trust is 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 very reassuring because you don't actually have to think or believe anything about it and if you're completely confused and you don't know what to think or what to believe, and you feel, you know, silenced and confused, then the one thing you can actually place your trust in is that if you lie down quietly and watch what happens, you'll witness the incredible power of life trying to help your body rest mm -hmm. so that you can feel restored and reconnected to your essential wisdom, which is what you are. You know, we're all this power of love, which is hugely wise. It's the power of life. And we're just letting her have a bit of a chance or having it a bit of a chance. I don't know what pronouns you want to use for, for the power of life, but you just let that power manifest itself by like you, the, your really wise body knows how to rest. And even if you've forgotten and you're so anxious and stressed that you feel you haven't slept in a long time, there will be some way that you can get into that resting state even for five or 10 minutes and notice that there is a, a trust you can place in your own essential nature as it's manifesting as your body rests. Yeah. Yes. Thank you. That's have to look outside. It's always inside. And that's one of the things, you know, sometimes people say, oh, well, I can't meditate because I need it to be quiet. And I can't do yoga nidra because it's too noisy. But it actually, it, you, it, the, the amount of noise and stuff that's going on, on outside is not, it's not a, barrier to yoga nidra in fact sometimes the opposite yeah we did have a student who was delivering these uh, yoga nidra practices like pretty much on the main flight path in and out of 
of Heathrow for, for, for people who are working in the airlines and, and they were resting right underneath this. And it's very noisy, you know? Oh. Even in those, even in places where there's a lot of noise and chaos, it's it's always possible to rest even just for five or ten minutes and to try and recover that trust in our capacity to restore ourselves. Yeah, now our capacity to, to restore ourselves. Yes, that's that's really that's really what it is about. I feel and something that you mentioned that I also want to highlight is that it really doesn't matter your background or your religion or your beliefs i feel it's the same with the dreams working with dreams looking to dreams it's like it really doesn't matter what you believe they come from or as long as you feel there is something there for you that you can look within yourself through those practices you can call it like again as you said the life itself the prana the the god within you like again the universe like it's just semantics in this case and looking within and giving yourself this this opportunity as you said this trust that there is wisdom within you that your body holds the ancient wisdom that you mentioned that you can reach it if you give it a chance and i think that this is such an empowering part of yoga nidra so then again we have the rest and we have the healing but also there is the empowerment and the trust in yourself in your soul in your body and we i feel that so many of us are just walking around this world completely disempowered and there's always someone else that we need to listen to. There is always someone above that knows better. As you said, you know, we are just being so blinded by the, the current state of the world, by the the way that how everything works. And we lose this trust in ourselves and in our body, in our hearts, in our inner wisdom. And this practice, it's so empowering for me because when I truly rested, I really understood so many things. So many things became clear, things that were very unclear for me. And it's this another layer of yoga nidra practice that I wish everyone could experience this connection with yourself and this trust within yourself. And as you said, with your, with, with your own body and the wisdom of your own body. And like, could it be any simpler? But at the same time, it seems so far away for many people. And, and it, it is simple and it, it's also because it's, it's like a naturally arising state. I would say almost every wisdom tradition in the world has accessed some form of this state of consciousness as part of their own spiritual practice for insight. Now, so the encyclopedia I've been looking at, part of my job, my, my remit, what I wanted to do was to restitute people's access to this state of being and the tradition I'm working with has come from South Asia. It's, it's, that's yoga nidra. It's part of the yoga tradition, yeah? But as I looked, I could see that all over the world, there were these different ways of connecting with this same state. So there are Sufi practices that bring you into that particular state at times of the night and day. I met Benedictine nuns mm. who recognized that state of being. There are the Toltec Mexica people, you know, they're in Mexico. Who are, their, their ancient wisdom is rooted in that dream space. So to the dream time of the uh, indigenous elders of Australia, and Sami people up in the north and the, the, the Xhosa people down in the south, like every place I looked to see where this freedom, it's a free a state of freedom mm. of, of accessing this deep wisdom. And everywhere you look, there are, there are ways of accessing this practice, this state of being. And I just feel very fortunate that many, I mean, many, that we've got access to yoga nidra as a preserved method that's been kind of developed in a contemporary kind of approach that makes it accessible to people. But it also shows us that actually it's a naturally arising state that, 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 that anybody can, can find within themselves. And so we're just using these guided, like meditative processes to help us rediscover that for ourselves so then we don't need any words once you figure that's once you found your way there you can you can get there anytime but sometimes we need more help you know sometimes it's nice to hear that voice around the fire like telling us these these ways to be and then we can trust that we can listen in yeah it's yeah. so it's so and it's and so beneficial and so practically free and as you said, like at, at some point, maybe you won't even need the guidance, you know, you can 
guide your own yoga nidra practice when you understand the elements of the yoga nidra practice so you can also get to this point i myself really love the guidance because it's kind of it's nice to not be in charge you know sometimes to just let someone else it's just listening yeah but after you learn a little bit about yoga nidra and the elements like you can also do it yourself so you don't even need anyone or anything you know not even the audio file to do that and Again, that's a, that's showing for me again that this is such an accessible practice for for everyone. Yeah. So, my dear Uma, is there any piece of advice, any anything that you would like to share with everyone who is currently struggling in pain, grieving, confused, angry, anything that you would like to share? I just like to share that we are. Um... We are gifted as humans with this inner capacity to restore and nourish ourselves and that actually whatever is going on and however painful it is, that if we can take even those few little moments just to rest and, and nourish ourselves, that then, yeah, it doesn't ease the pain or the stress or make it go away. It just means that we can actually show up more helpful and hopefully more whole and it welcomes in all parts of ourselves so i just encourage people if it's at all possible wherever you are to take even just like five ten minutes of just that like deep rest to just lay on the earth and remember that we're all part of this earth and we're all on the earth together at the same time it's just, we're all one and that when we let rest and listen to our aching exhausted bodies and minds then we can be held in that rest and um, that's beneficial for us but for everybody around us also thank you so much really it was such a beautiful and valuable conversation and so needed right now i believe and if you like to just share where can anyone find more information about you what you do your teaching your retreats you do so many things so many amazing things all around the world so where should they go well, the first place is just go to the Yoga Nidra Network. Yoga Nidra Network, it's .org. Yoga Nidra Network, all one word. And uh, that's the website. And all our events are always listed there, trainings and retreats and all that kind of thing. And there's also the opportunity to get free. There's a library there under resources, a library of Yoga Nidra in 23 different languages. So whether you just want to listen in or when you want to train up or come on a retreat, that's the place to go, the Yoga Nidra. I also like, I'm, we've got a little presence on Instagram, Yoga Nidra Network, and my own name, Uma Dinsmore Tuli. Yes, so yeah, we sh and I share like Nidras on my Patreon. That's the place. If you, if, you get, if you really get into it and you want to have like Yoga Nidra sent to your phone every day, then you can find me on Patreon. Uh, which is a, a subscription platform. Yeah, thank you. And I can uh, very really recommend the the everyday yoga nidra practice with Uma. I am myself part of the group, and I'm receiving a uh, yoga nidra every day to my WhatsApp, and it's it's really amazing. There's different yoga nidra every day, and it reminds you about the of the practice. So as Uma said, if, if you really get into it and you would like to try, you know, you can give it a try for one month and see what happens for yourself. You don't need to believe me or Uma about this incredible effects of yoga nidra. So you can just try it yourself. Yeah, blessings. And, and see what happens to your dream life because it often is a real support for dreamers. Blessings. On you, Joanna. Thank you for inviting me. Thank you so much, Uma, for being yeah. here and bringing this beautiful presence of yours and amazing painting and energy and wisdom. And Isn't really, the my husband, they're lip to Tuli. So, yeah, you can see all of these. There's a lot of them. These are all different manifestations of this power of life. They're lip to Tuli artist. <laughs> Incredible paintings. And only looking, looking at those paintings, it's already bringing some very special energy to me. Awesome. Thank you, Uma. Yeah, thank you, love. Keep up the good works, Blue Lotus Queendom. <laughs> <laughs> we'll try, we'll do my best. Thank you, Uma, thank you so much. I really hope that you enjoyed this show. If you did, please consider giving it a like and maybe leaving a review. And most importantly, feel free to share it with your family and friends. For more information about my work and projects, 
you can check out my website www.bluelotusqueendom.com.